debate and situation. And at least in my case, I'm a member of the, the uh, European People's Party family, which is the biggest. Yeah. Donald Tusk and, and Jean-Claude Juncker sits at the same table when we meet in Brussels next time in December. And uh, I, I, I shared with many, with people like Nicolas Sarkozy, who is back at the table from France, that, that to start with quota as the beginning of the answer or the system was wrong, was not, not uh, a, a good uh, beginning. Um, but to deal now with the situation seriously and, and, and really uh, is a must for all, individually for countries and also for, for the community. Central Europe has different history. I'm happy you, you, you use the term central. For decades I had to oppose we are Eastern Europe. We are not East, Eastern Europe. There is Western, Central, Eastern. There is European mosaic of, of a different countries, different regions, different languages, different cultures. Europe is very old, nice, and, and valued, valued or precious um, diversity and unity. And Central Europe means something in, in the center, something what was a battlefield between the big powers in the past, during the century of fears, century of fears, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a notion mm. of uh, Ilya, uh, that's an important, now I'll come to this, uh, it, it is something where these countries were part of uh, ethnic uh, purchase uh, uh, when uh, more totalitarian time has, has flown than freedom, a very limited uh, decades of democratic experience. Now we have 25 years of freedom, it's one generation, one uh, uh, university life. Uh, means uh, a new experience with freedom, responsibility, common Europe, and all these aki and, and, and uh, multicultural um, uh, society around. But uh, also my response was, if not um, um, compulsory quota, but, but functioning and responsible uh, solidarity. Because solidarity is something which must be based more on people-to-people -people relationship than bureaucratic or administrative relationship. And this response in my spectrum, in my uh, party, is, is there. I oppose my prime minister to sue the European Union because of quotas. It's something dubious. And this term was used by the member of the government of Slovakia. I agree. It's dubious for domestic reasons. There is a lot of politics in, in the situation. There is, there is a lot of calculation today. And I am against the calculation because it is about so in your not eyes money but people now yeah. dealing. And, and we are ready to, to, to show and share solidarity. So you think that it's Slovakia should accept, in fact, the mandatory quota, even though that was the wrong starting point? For it was the wrong starting point, and Slovakia should claim that the rule of law is important in Slovakia, for Slovakia, in Europe, for Europe. Yeah. If legal experts says that rule of law is not good because majority, then I'm against some taxation laws in Slovakia which, was, which were not reasonable and uh, are against uh, economic growth in this country. But I have to observe majority and legislation which is valid. So is it, in your eyes, is it acceptable for a member state of the European Union to limit their refugee intake, say, to Christians? Or to Look, asylum whites? No, no. Asylum procedure is based on strict rules and, and we, are, we are a country which observes uh, international and national legislation. It's not based on religion or, or race. Yeah. Uh, so I oppose this approach. Uh, for future, for long term, for integration, of course there are significant uh, sensitivities, but this is not issue of asylum seeking and asylum treatment, mm. no. Well, I think we'll come to that in the next round. A final political question, um, and then we'll move on. How do you perceive the role of Angela Merkel in this crisis? Has she been um, throwing her weight around too much? Has she been... Um, creating problems for others, or has she been showing moral leadership? 
or all of the above? Simple question, mm. but not so simple situation and answer. If I mentioned constitutional crisis, yeah. economic and uh, financial, and I know what it was inside, and I was there when Angela Merkel replaced Gerhard Schröder, I was in the commission, in Prodis commission, uh, and then Barroso's. She brought a lot of pro-European commitment, um, balanced approach vis-à-vis -vis smaller states. It was not kind of a curatorium or, or um, um, directorium against the rest. And uh, I think she helped significantly, uh, decisively, to address constitutional crisis, economic and financial. Nothing is perfect, nobody, uh, nobody is perfect. Uh, and her role was uh, unreplaceable in those years and decade. On, uh, on, on this sort of uh, situation, I would say that messages from largest European uh, EU country on readiness to absorb, to accept uh, up to 800,000 uh, refugees messages spread very easily and, and swiftly throughout an outside continent meant, for example, that in Syria, Syria or in, in a refugee camps, uh, most of people think and believe that they are welcomed and expected in Europe or, or in Germany. Uh, and um, I hope that in Germany, now after Sunday, CDU and CSU and SPD uh, Merkel and uh, Seehofer and, and uh, Gabriel mm. um, will be able to keep on going and to address uh, steps which are necessary now. Otherwise, without Germany and without consolidated uh, um, approach, we shall not consolidate situation together. And I think that consolidation of the situation is a base for credibility of Europe at intra and add extra. Yes. And it will not go without German government led by, or now led by, Angela Merkel. But there may have been an error in communication in the way Angela Merkel communicated to the Syrian refugees the willingness to there is always There is always a lot of simplification, uh, yeah. propaganda, misuse by, for example, illegal uh, um, traffickers, yeah. by, by organized crime. We've got a question about organized crime. We'll come to that in a second. I wanted to um, ask first, uh, Marie Kibinimi, will the refugees pay for our pensions and our welfare systems? Yes, for, for their part, but the integration is the kind of uh, the key word, as I said already um, earlier. And in certain countries, uh, there are uh, areas where countries have difficulties to get uh, employees. So in, in certain uh, countries, in certain uh, areas, it really can uh, be of, of help when more people come to, to the uh, country. But, but really what is important is that uh, we can't uh, look at the immigrants or refugees as one group because they have different origins, different skills, different backgrounds. Mm. So, and that ac actually makes the integration process very challenging because you need tailored uh, measures so for some of them, you need to improve the uh, basic skills, but actually the amount of uh, highly educated uh, immigrants and refugees have increased during the uh, years, and we have to take care at that there is not either uh, brain waste, which is happening actually uh, now. So if, if we invest in them now, then in the long run, they will help to pay our Yes, exactly. And exactly. We, we have to think of it as uh, an uh, investment. But with, when it comes to uh, uh, this brain waste, one interesting figure is that when we look at uh, the well-educated immigrants who have their degrees from foreign uh, universities, uh, so 42% of them work in a lower skilled jobs mm. than what education so they we're, have. So we're not taking enough advantage uh, of Yes, and right. but when it comes to those immigrants who have their degrees uh, from the domestic university, yeah. they're only 22% of them uh, work in jobs uh, with, uh, where the requirements are lower than what their education. Mm. So there are a lot, lot uh, to be done and in order also 
uh, to look at uh, kind of uh, the transparency when it comes to decrees. Of course, in every country, you have to be sure that a decree which you have has the same level as, uh, as uh, you have in, in your country. Uh, but I think uh, the system is not functioning uh, properly when you uh, hear these figures. That's certainly something to bear in mind. Cathy, you want to come in on that? I just think there is, there is certainly scope for changing the narrative into a lot more, posi a lot more positive one. Not only the OECD uh, research, but uh, a number of other studies and, and, and research show that there is one area we haven't talked about yet. There is one area of public policy that's the most predictable of all, and that's demography. And mm -hmm. this is a continent where the labor is shrinking, which, especially in Central Europe, uh, as Jan would uh, certainly agree, Indeed. the the demographic projections are very dire. And uh, so you have you have a pool. You will have to look for a pool of labor in the next 10, 15, 20 years in our in this very country and in all the countries around it, and in many parts of Europe. So that's that's one real uh, sort of driver that should that should for yeah. push for integration. But the other the other aspect is that the people who come here, and it doesn't matter whether they come from uh, a poor background in Africa or whether they are fleeing uh, Syria and you know Aleppo. They, the one thing that unifies them, and I agree that they have diverse backgrounds, but the one thing that unifies them is that they are risk takers, they have drive, and hence they are much more likely to be entrepreneurial, right? So it's the, it's the best and brightest that, that, uh, that go and, and take the dangerous journey to make it here. So I think that uh, they can, if, if the policies are uh, done well and if the, uh, if the countries uh, use the integration capacity that uh, they may have, because it's not a financial and it's not a logistical challenge at these numbers. It's certainly not. Yeah. It's a mental challenge and it's an integration challenge. And if it's, uh, if it's done well, they could contribute to making the societies diverse and hence more resilient in this new era of exponentiality and global developments that are hard to adapt to. And if you have a society that's more diverse, it's going to be more de adaptable, Mary, almost by definition. Back on that? Sorry, yes, I, yeah. I just wanted to say that, uh, of course, we are not either saying that this is a kind of a, a nice story, everybody wins. That is not no. the case. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, if the integration doesn't uh, um, kind of, if we don't ex succeed in that, uh, also certain groups uh, in those countries where a lot of immigrants and also refugees come, uh, and especially when it comes to low-skilled jobs, uh, s the native-born could be in yeah. much worse position. So I think uh, information uh, delivering is uh, kind of the key, and also we have to be able to uh, deliver all that information, which is not so uh, nice. Yeah, I was going to come to that, that, that there are losers uh, of immigration, um, and that's the same whether they're refugees or... Um, economic migrants or whatever, um, and those tend to be the people um, at the bottom of the pile in our own societies, uh, what used to be called the white working class. Um, and they are the people who are, first of all, losers from globalization in general, uh, because they've been priced out of jobs by imports, um, but also uh, specifically competitors for um, public spending on housing, schooling, healthcare, uh, and, and, and social benefits with uh, the new arrivals and who uh, I, I hear uh, in Germany to some extent, I know Jörg Asmussen is still around or whether he's had to leave us, but one hears stories from Germany that of, of uh, uh, German working class people saying, you know, all of this money all is, is being spent on accommodating the refugees, what about us? Um, so I think that's certainly something we need to think about. Um, sorry, Liz, you had a point to make? I can also speak to that, because I yeah. think that's, a, that's something we're underestimating at the moment. I, I you know, welcome positive narratives towards migration, but I think we should be very careful about too closely linking economic benefits to refugee populations mm -hmm. as a driver for welcoming more. There is an international legal responsibility yeah. to 
um, protect those in need of protection, regardless of their economic costs and benefits. So, you know, we have to keep that as the as the headline. And I think the second reason to, to sort of be very careful about this is there's been a lot of talk over the last few months of, you know, does, they're Syrian engineers, they're Syrian doctors. This is fantastic. We need these people, and that's great as long as your Syrian engineering qualification is recognised in the country you arrive in. Right. And one of the major challenges for us over the next decade, and this is particularly a challenge for Germany, which has a quite a rigid labour market and recognition system, is how do you manage to recognise that qualification and or create the kind of bridging programmes and skills development programmes that will facilitate access to the labour market at the right level. And one of the ways to think about this is not just investment in recognition of qualifications, but also skills development programmes that look at host populations, native communities, as well as new refugee communities, and thinking about that sort of investment for the whole community and population. And here I think there's, a, there's completely an under, underserved role for, for private sector actors here. Well, that's certainly a message that we would want to, uh, to pass on to Jörg Asmussen, who in his day job is Deputy Labour Minister <laughs> and responsible for uh, a lot of those things. We've had some questions from the audience, so I'd like to um, start by taking one or two that have been uh, sent in anonymously and then ask some real members of the audience to give us um, their questions and comments. Uh, but first of all, as peripheral EU states, what role can Croatia, Romania, Bulgaria play as positive influences for um, EU desires, EU wishes in the Western Balkans region, for example, on migration? Uh, Katy, these are your, not quite your, um, your, your clients because they're already member states, but used to be clients. They're near the clients of DG They're near, near. the clients. Um, well, uh, I would echo uh, my neighbor here on the panel, Jan, and say yeah. that uh, first and foremost, uphold the, uh, uphold the Aki in their own countries. Yeah. And, uh, and certainly, uh, should they become uh, or continue to be uh, transit states, you know, not... not uh, not be inclined to to be uh, closing borders, etc. But yeah. uh, these are all uh, non-Schengen countries, so they are they are outside 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 of the um, uh, smaller uh, Schengen space. Uh, in the Western Balkans, I think that ironically we are uh, slightly better equipped in providing concrete support than we are inside the EU. Uh, actually, through the because there is a there is an assistance mechanism in place, yep. uh, we were able very quickly to reorient and reprogram um, uh, a lot of the assistance towards uh, migration management, border management, uh, work with the host communities, uh, in addition to the uh, humanitarian uh, aid in general. So we are we are ironically. Uh, better equipped to react quickly because a lot of the a lot of the mechanisms for example humanitarian assistance is only for outside the EU and this crisis has uh, shown that mechanisms for quick reaction inside the EU mm. may need to be developed in the future as well they don't exist yet so we, we are able to react quicker and uh, certainly the help of Bulgaria Romania Croatia to the western balkan countries would be very welcome because uh, uh, logistical help is needed, uh, uh, expert help is needed, material support is needed, but uh, on, on our side, on the, on the EU side, I'll just use one, one example. Uh, we were able to reprogram 10 million euros for, uh, for Serbia and the uh, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. Within, between adoption in the Commission and contracting, we spent only three weeks, which is like lightning yep. speed for, yep. uh, for the EU. So certainly help both in terms of personnel and, and money, material would be, would be most welcome. Great. Well, um, there's a couple of issues which we haven't discussed yet, but which are there in the public and therefore reflected in our audience. Um, one is concern about terrorism, the other is concern about organized crime and trafficking. So um, one question, um, which I'm going to put to Jan Fiegel, but others are welcome to um, come in. Um, how do we avoid the known phenomenon um, um, with an already mostly integrated Muslim population that where some in the second generation 
born in Europe, turned to terrorism. Um, that's a whole panel subject in itself, probably. Um, and the other one, um, what link is there between migratory human trafficking and other illicit forms of trafficking? Um, is there any discussion of the nexus between this crisis and, and um, other security threats? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a huge topic. Um, and um, maybe I would start with uh, mentioning one book from uh, Israeli author um, Amos Oz, mm -hmm. How to Cure a Fanatic. This is the title, very short, small book, which speaks about dividing line in our lives and societies. It is not between civilizations, it is not between cultures, between uh, people, basically, but it goes through our inner conscience. Either we respect life, res respect dignity of everybody, or not. And the other side of the line is fanaticism of any sort, ideological, atheistic, political, religious, you, you, may, you may continue. And there are different examples in human history and European history especially of the sorts and waves of fanaticism. Antidose and uh, response is uh, education, 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 which means uh, knowing more and respecting more because um, we may become happier in France, in Germany, in Slovakia, in relationship, not isolated, not solo, not uh, uh, embraced by, by um, our, uh, the, the, the walls or hand fences. And uh, I think that this is phenomenon which speaks by itself that integration is quite a uh, demanding process. Integration is neither absorption nor assimilation. Integration means participation as equals, uh, taking part on the same civic uh, uh, human base. And for that, we need to bring uh, understanding of minorities and majorities together, not, not to nurture parallel, parallel societies, as we frequently see, but really help um, children to grow together, to know the culture of the neighbor, and to build up neighborhood in the neighborhood, not around Europe, but not where people really live. Integration, even European integration, starts at home in the yeah. country. It goes on via neighborhood with the neighbors. I am happy that Visegrad is something that is quite known and it's not imposed. It is something very uh, European in living together and even even working together in political terms. And this is example and contribution also to European uh, uh, policies. I think we still need to learn the best practices, to put together uh, quality and, uh, and access to education as a double objective, not only access and then you have egalitarian system without quality, or only or solo quality and you have elitistic uh, mm -hmm. uh, system. So this is more about education and living together. Liz, terrorism and <laughs> trafficking. Can I add something, because I think Jan's making an important point. Very briefly, I can see the, uh, the audience is <laughs> getting edgy to ask questions. So, so it, it, I can draw on the French example yeah. when it comes to integration. And I think identity is very important. There was some research a few years ago in France where they asked a lot of second generation immigrants, so the children of immigrants, yeah. do you feel French? Very high percentage said, yes, I feel French. The second question said, do you think others think you are French? The number dropped. So people who felt French were aware that no one else in France thought of them as French. And the body language of the state is extraordinarily important. If a state says you are or you are not part of us, you are not part of our society, you are in, you are out, that has a strong effect, particularly on the second generation, about how they feel about participating in a society. And we've seen that in a number of countries. And I right. think we should be very aware of the narratives and the identi identity issues that are involved with yep. this. And when it comes to human trafficking and smuggling and financing, we haven't looked more close, closely enough at financing. I mean, there are investigative journalists 
making links between ISIS and smuggling. I think there are huge crossovers between different criminal networks. This is a very horizontal phenomenon. Many people are migrants themselves, facilitating the next stage of their journey through, through uh, helping co-nationals across the next stage of the smuggled journey, so they're not necessarily smugglers. There are organized crime networks involved in this. There's a huge diversity of, of, of smuggling it's, it's and trafficking networks. It's a billion networks, dollar business. But it is a huge business with high profits and extremely low risk. And yeah. if you wanted to be involved in other nefarious actors, the barriers to entry are extremely low. Yeah. I, I heard uh, Mark Pierini the other day say that, that it was a billion dollar business now this year in Turkey if you reckon that each family spent on average 2,500 euros uh, to get from Syria to Europe um, and most of that money was going to intermediaries in Turkey. Um, worth, worth bearing in mind. Right, it's your turn. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you've been very patient. Gentlemen over there, I'll take sort of perhaps two or three questions at a time. Uh, please Introduce yourself, tell us who your question or comment is for, and keep it short. Thank you. Milan Izhavica, Mesa 10, Think Tank from Bratislava, Slovakia. The question is to anybody who wishes to answer that, I, and I'd like to return with no disrespect uh, to the people who are no longer here to the previous panel. Mm. And two things intrigued me very much. One was uh, when State Secretary Asmussen spoke about uh, the constitutional right uh, to claim asylum in Germany. And he always makes a very precise argument. And today he also made a very precise argument with one caveat, and that was that he said that the right is unlimited. That means that there's no ceiling, mm -hmm. which I think is constitutionally and juristically praiseworthy, and from the point of human rights also praiseworthy. From the point of policy, uh, it's very, uh, I would say, uh, ambiguous because uh, what I think it does, it encourages uh, anybody abroad to kick out as many people as you would like to from your own country. Uh, because it says, well, we will receive as many as you can kick out. So that's first, maybe some comment from the panelists. And second was uh, when we are dealing with the refugee crisis in Europe, I think that we are dealing with it both domestically and uh, externally. And domestically, the debate is mostly, I would say, not mostly, but to a great extent, uh, limited to snipping from one prime minister to the other. But what I'm missing is that uh, helping Germany while we are watching uh, Chancellor Merkel to take a deep uh, uh, in the nasty water, uh, helping to project an argument that uh, there are 145 signatories to the UN Geneva Conventions. This is not uh, solely a European problem. Uh, are we so weak in the European Union that we can't talk uh, to the countries of the Gulf and we can only say statistically that, well, they haven't taken in anybody, but we have to take uh, in everybody? Isn't it a time that uh, we showed also not only a big heart that we have for everybody, but also some brains and the teeth, because UN Convention is not just a piece of paper to which you sign and then do nothing. Thanks. Gotcha. Uh, two questions. I think they mainly go to Liz, although you didn't say to whom. Gentleman in the front row. Milan Nitsch, Tsepi Think Tank, based here in Breslau. Two questions. One is about a twinning mechanism or bilateral arrangement, which, for instance, this country, this country on one hand uh, tried to turn down or sink down the quotas, the EU relocation mechanism, with some numbers. On the other hand, offered bilaterally to Austria to host temporarily 500 uh, asylum seekers from Austria. And I wonder uh, what would be comments from the Commission and uh, from experts, Liz, about this arrangement. Mm -hmm. I know Austrian ambassador is in the room and he's listening. Second, <laughs> Western Balkans over the winter may become a waiting room, a huge giant waiting yeah. room for many refugees. Uh, it's partly by design because what Germany needs is to slow down the, the, the whole flow. They cannot handle 10,000 new uh, migrants a day. Maybe they can handle 3,000. So what, uh, 
what is the capacity there to house people to, we know that in Germany now people are in tents. What about the Western Balkans? And what can countries like Slovakia, that has a long relationship uh, of friendship and support of Western Balkan countries do in this? And attached to this for Jan Figel, we will have a presidency of the EU after Dutch. And this migration crisis might decide the success or failure of our presidency, how we handle it. I don't think, I don't see our Ministry of Interior and other people involved in preparation of the presidency focusing entirely on this. The Dutch are already doing it. So as a politician, former commissioner, EU negotiator, what would you do if you would be in charge? Right. You're not, but what would you okay. do? Okay, great, thank you very much. Is there a third question in this round? Yes, sir. Um, can, I, can I just say that women are allowed to ask questions too? <laughs> Not only on the panel. As well as answering them. Thank you very much for the floor. There is autumn. Winter is coming. Yeah. Uh, there is some project for really decreasing all these problems of migrants walking through several countries. Project of the creation of some, let's say, train bridge or plane bridge, this kind of support. It was discussed because really... An airlift, a Berlin airlift, as it were. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, that's plenty to ask. Uh, to let me start and try and allocate some of those questions. Um, German constitution and European teeth with, uh, with the Arab world. Uh, Liz, would you like to take those? Sure. Open-ended <laughs> asylum. <laughs> I would be delighted. Um, there's, I mean, the thing about the Geneva Convention on International Law is there are some unfinished questions about it. You have the right to claim asylum, but a country also is the one that bestows protection. So it's not necessarily unlimited if countries find other means to offer that protection. And some of the issues, the concepts that are now being discussed in, in many countries is, can we designate Turkey a safe third country. Um, in international law, under certain circumstances, you can say you have passed through a safe country where you could and have received protection on your way to us, therefore we can send you back to that. Yeah. So there are, you know, there is an unlimited right to claim asylum. And the same would apply to Iran as a safe country for Afghans. In theory, you have to meet some very, very strict legal criteria, and uh, the UNHCR is currently revising its guidelines on this, and it'll be interesting to see how you might, who and how countries might fall under this rubric. But, mm -hmm. it, you know, there are the practical organization of the, of, of the right to claim asylum is something that's, that's deeply complex and could allow for quite a lot of movement. I mean, the entire Dublin system is premised on the safe third country concept, except if you're uh, returning people to Greece, obviously. Um, when it comes to internationalizing this issue, you know, it's much easier to internationalize the funding side of this issue and do pledging conferences, and there'll be another pledging conference in the new year. Um, it's notable that there will be a World Humanitarian Summit held in Istanbul in May of next year. So there is this moment now to really talk, okay, are we going to bring the international community together to discuss these things together? Um, there are precedents. There, there was a comprehensive plan of action that was agreed in the 1980s to deal with displacement from Vietnam. Now, while the political and contextual situation in Vietnam was very, very different, there are some lessons to be learned about what it takes for an international community to come together and decide how to equitably dis divide up responsibility. There is that precedent, and there's growing pressure to talk about either a global resettlement program or some form of international congress that would have be able to have this conversation. Um, and it is notable that you know, the US and Canada have been increasingly asking Europeans, what can we do to help? But also countries that have never really been involved in this before. Brazil and Argentina have been offering humanitarian visas to Syrians um, and taken several thousand each so far. Mexico is getting ready to launch a resettlement program. It's never done that before. There are new actors coming into the field. And when it comes to the Gulf states, I recognize the challenge of, of sort of how do you ask Gulf states to take refugees? It's not, it's not in their sort of uh, philosophy. What is interesting to note is the number of Syrian nationals who've been given labor visas mm. in the Gulf region. 
And that's something that also happens in Europe. If it's easier to access the labor market than claim asylum, many people will come and try and access the labor market. In Poland, for example, Ukrainians are using the labor migration route rather than the asylum route because it's a lot easier and it's been made a lot easier. So we should also look at different ways in which people can access protection, which isn't necessarily within the sort of legally defined criteria of the Geneva but, Convention. But one, one sort of possible model that you're po pointing to there or sketching is that we could put pressure on Saudi Arabia or Qatar or wherever to pay for Syrian refugees to go to Brazil or Argentina rather than Munich. Interesting. So there are concepts of private sponsorship that are emerging. It's long-standing in Canada, it's which is the like idea of offsetting the costs of resettlement by getting community actors involved. It's a bit like the American but definition of But you're suggesting an international trading of, of resettlement places. The American definition of a Zionist is a Jew who pays for a second Jew so that a third Jew should go and live in Israel. Um, I mean, it, it may be worth having a global conversation about what an equitable division of responsibility is when yeah. some of that responsibility is financial and some of that is human and, there are, and, and what it would actually take. Um, I'm personally not convinced by the idea of trading quotas for humans. I, yes. I, I think that could go in a negative direction. Fair enough. But some more innovative, creative responses to get a bigger international response is definitely necessary. Okay. Oh, um, this one, may I just the West Bal I was going to ask you about the West Balkan waiting room, but go on Thank if you, you. want to jump in. I'll, I'll get to the West Balkan waiting room in a second, but just very quickly on what Liz was saying. Let's not forget, we don't need to talk about Bahrain and, and Syria, uh, Saudi Arabia, sorry, and, uh, and Kuwait. I think that the really urgent international and much more stepped up international response that's needed is to help the two countries that are completely overwhelmed and stranded and not enough attention is being paid to Jordan and Lebanon. Mm. They are middle income countries that yep. are borrowing from the international financial institutions at higher rates than, than otherwise mm -hmm. and it's, they have a completely non-self-imposed uh, crisis, the systems are overwhelmed and nobody's paying attention. So let's not forget that there is a reservoir of two and a half million people just in, Sy uh, just in Lebanon and Jordan. So mm -hmm. before we would, we would venture into how to force or cajole Saudi Arabia into taking someone, let's take off, let's take care of the host communities and I very much yeah. agree that the investment needs to go not only to the refugees but the host communities as well yeah. Yeah. and this is something this is another crisis that is very easy to foresee they are going to get up and move within the next I don't know whether month or weeks or years but it's going to come unless we it's take a, a resolute yes it's a yeah. disaster waiting to happen yeah. And not enough attention is being paid. We've got roughly 10 more minutes. Um, so the Western Balkans West Balkan waiting, waiting room, room. The Western Balkans waiting room is uh, exactly what uh, my humble part of the commission is trying to prevent and argue argue against. We are very concerned about attempts that uh, are actually vocalized by 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 uh, some member states of sort of desiring to keep the. The, 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 the refugees in the Western mm. Balkan countries. I think that particularly former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia is in no, no shape to, to, have, uh, to be hosting huge uh, numbers currently. Serbia is a little better off. Um, uh, the Prime Minister himself uh, spoke about you know, being able to accommodate uh, a dozen, potentially up to 20,000 people, but these are really short-term uh, short measures. So I agree, there is a huge danger that uh, unless we do it carefully, there could be another bigger problem arising in the, in the Western Balkans. So uh, that is something that is certainly not in the interest of the EU. And I think that you mentioned uh, very well, you know, Slovakia and other countries in the region are very interested in in the Western Balkans, and this could be potentially a very concrete way of helping them, both in sending people there as well as maybe exploring the model that we have in Austria. I spoke with the Austrian Ministry of uh, uh, Interior last Friday about the model, and uh, it's, it's a very interesting one. This is because the twinning model. It, or, yeah. Twinning is a, is a way of, yes, it's a way of calling it. Yeah. It's a very interesting model and also the lesson from it. So uh, Slovakia accommodated 500 uh, asylum seekers for Austria mm -hmm. uh, temporarily in a, in a town called Gabčíkovo here. 
And the residents and the mayor were so worried about it, they actually organized a referendum against it, overwhelmingly against uh, having the, the, the asylum seekers stay there. Few months down the line, the mayor himself said, we were needlessly worried. Mm. It worked. And so I think that that's, uh, that's very know. much a, a lesson. When you look at the Eurobarometer, uh, the countries that have very few migrants are the ones that tend to be most anti-migrant. And uh, yeah. the yeah. ones where you have experience with them are, are we, lower. We, so I think we may get a chance if, if we're very quick to ask Mary about her country, which is a country that has very few migrants and is uh, having a nervous breakdown over them. Um, but first, Jan. Uh, um, the, the Slovak presidency yeah. um, coming up, what should you be preparing for? What would you be preparing for if you uh, were in government? If I may, I would uh, add maybe three points. Yeah. First, uh, when I represented political majority, we passed in the years 2003-2004 via migration office of Slovakia up to 10,000 refugees, mm. so mostly from uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. No referenda, no problem, no scare. Normally, mature way. Today, it's something, I think, pre-electoral. We shall have elections, my friends. So as, as an so, opposition politician who's going to be contesting those elections, yeah. do, you, do you argue against uh, uh, the prime minister? Or do no, no, you no. basically? Ignore the issue, say it's a non-issue, we've done this in the past, let's move on to the real issues which in my mind are X and Y. I'm sorry that this, this uh, gremium doesn't speak too much or very little about the roots mm. of the problem, rather about the, the, the realities, situation and, and the, the complexities. Mm. If we don't heal the wounds, the roots, we don't have answers, real answers, credible answers, long-term answers to the situation on the continent. So I would uh, respond to Milan Ježovica on, um, on uh, German response. I'm happy that Germany now and since Adenauer is full of Verfassungspatriotismus, mm. something based on constitution and patriotism and, European and foreign policy uh, which is uh, linked to European policy. Core of German foreign policy is European policy. And that's that's good for us, that's good for Germany. And I think what, what is needed to add to this legalistic, a constitutional approach that everybody has right, I think they have right to have a, uh, a country which belongs to people. I mean they, refugees from Syria. So let us, let us help Syrian people to get their country back from jihadists, from caliphate, from ISIS. Yep. ISIS is the biggest international and global, global threat. So let us deal with that. Otherwise, we are lost in, in this nitty gritty debates. So there is a threat, ultimate threat, and either we do something and eliminate such threat, or we shall have much more difficult situations in Europe of uh, next year. Slovakia's uh, presidency uh, Minister of Interior has a lot to do, and elections is coming. I think this debate should be with people from Interior Ministry, from Migration Office, and not only in Slovakia, but broadly, more internationally. But it's up to them and up to organizers to invite. Uh, what I would do differently, I think, of course, it's important to, to prepare by action, by doing, not by sort of planning, but uh, in a refugee crisis, is something a long term, at least uh, we may expect. And what we shall probably need is kind of a revitalization or boost of Schengen and security policy. More coherent approach, which means foreign and security policy, more together with other policies, humanitarian development. Uh, maybe Schengen group, like we have Euro group of ministers with permanent president and some, some mechanisms to deal with highly sensitive issue and more sensitive than ever and it will not be uh, <coughs> diminished in next years but even more sensitive as I say and we didn't speak too much about terrorism mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and of course uh, we should uh, also uh, prepare 
prepare for a credible Slovakia, Slo Slovak input into, into this uh, um, preparation of uh, presidency. So um, I would, I would uh, go for more active and responsive action. If I was quoted at the tweet that I said people to people, people to people uh, solidarity is something uh, important and then there was something about why don't do we have institutions? Yeah. Everything, and it, that's a quote from either Schumann or Monet, everything comes through people and, and remains via institutions. If we want to integrate in France or in Germany or in Slovakia somebody to live together, it must be via people, but institutions, ministers, ministries, governments should uh, facilitate, should create conditions which are safe, uh, uh, realistic for for people to people living together, integrating together. Uh, if not, then we shall have uh, 